Nothing in this podcast or on our website should be construed as medical advice. Consult your healthcare provider for your individual nutritional and medical needs. The information presented is based on our research and is strictly that of the author and not necessarily those of any professional group or other individual. Hi, I'm Sue Becker from Bread Beckers with Sue's Healthy Minutes. I'm so excited today. I'm anticipating that you will experience an aha moment as the light bulbs in your brain begin to light up from connections that you are going to make concerning some of the chronic health complaints you're experiencing every day. The information I'm about to share leaves most people saying, you just described me. Well, today we're going to begin our journey of looking at the common diseases that plague most Americans that are directly or indirectly related to the nutrients and fiber being sifted from commercially processed flour with the removal of the nutritious bran and germ. We will begin this journey with a thorough discussion of perhaps the most common disease of all, constipation. Yes, I said it, constipation. In fact, it's been stated that America is the most constipated nation in the world. I'm not sure how this statistic was discovered, but I can certainly believe that it just might be true. But I also believe that the rest of the world has followed us as they too have embraced more and more commercially processed bread. Now, some health experts might not classify constipation as a disease, but if you look at the technical definition of the word disease, you just might have to disagree with them. A disease is defined as an abnormal condition that affects the whole body of an organism. Well, I'm here today to tell you that constipation is definitely not normal and that it definitely affects the whole body of the organism. Constipation is indeed related to a whole host of other physical complaints, some of which might seem to be unrelated. As we look at the correlation between constipation and disease and the bread we eat, or should I say need to eat, we will be discussing fiber and the critical role it plays in digestion as well as elimination in a way that you perhaps have never heard. And I will most likely be describing at least some of you. Over the years, my children have affectionately called this mom's poopy talk, but I prefer to call it your digestion and elimination. In 1982, the Health Education Council of Great Britain stated that all in all, fiber might be the single most important form of food likely to be lacking in your everyday diet. I can say this is even more true today for America and most of the industrialized world than it was in 1982. We hear so much talk about needing to get more fiber in our diets. And even though we have been aware of its values for decades, many people still do not understand what fiber is, where it comes from, the significant role it plays in our good health, and more specifically, how to increase their intake. By the end of this episode, you will totally understand what fiber is, what fiber does in your body, and how real bread can be a delicious provider of this much needed nutrient. So let's get started. Simply put, fiber is a type of carbohydrate in plant foods that cannot be completely broken down during digestion by our digestive enzymes alone. There are two main categories of fiber, soluble and insoluble. Plant foods such as fruits, vegetables, and legumes contribute mostly soluble fiber, while whole grains are a particularly good source of both types of fiber. Soluble fiber works by absorbing water during digestion It forms a gel-like substance that has many health benefits, such as helping to lower blood cholesterol levels, stabilizing blood sugar, and giving the feeling of fullness long after eating. In other words, this fiber is a belly filler. Insoluble fiber is found in legumes, vegetable skins, the peels of fruits such as apples, grapes, and blueberries, firm vegetables such as broccoli and carrots, and particularly the bran portion of whole grains. 
It is this fiber that gives plants and vegetables their firmness and strength. As learned in the previous episode, it is the bran of whole grains that serves as the protective outer layer of seeds. Now that we know what fiber is, let's look at what fiber does. We cannot digest insoluble fiber, but despite its undigested transit through our digestive system, fiber plays an important role in our elimination process. Fiber has three basic functions in this process. Number one, fiber increases the bulk of the stool. Number two, fiber softens the stool. And my personal favorite, fiber shortens the transit time. That's just a nice way of saying that you will poop more often and more regularly. But before we can eliminate our waste or poop, we have to digest our food. So let's look now at digestion and how it works to break down our food to give us the nutrients we need. We will begin our discussion of digestion by looking first at how digestion is supposed to progress if we are consuming a real food diet consisting of whole grains and beans, fresh fruits and vegetables, and of course, some real bread. Even before eating begins, the anticipation of food coming in stimulates glands in the mouth to produce saliva. Our saliva contains a carbohydrate digestive enzyme known as salivary amylase that is mixed with our food as we chew. The mixing of saliva with our food not only lubricates the food, making it easier to swallow, but also begins the process of carbohydrate digestion, particularly the starches. So our digestive process actually begins in the mouth. I cannot stress enough the importance of chewing your food. This chewing breaks down the food into smaller particles, making them easier to digest, especially further down the digestive system. One final truth to be noted here before we leave the mouth. This presence of salivary amylase should alone give us incredible evidence that we are indeed designed by our Creator to digest carbohydrates. Once adequately chewed and our food is swallowed, it will enter the stomach where protein digestion will begin. Protein digestive enzymes produced by the cells in the stomach lining require a very acidic environment to do their job. The stomach lining is also designed with cells that produce acid that will create the perfect acidic environment for the protein digestive enzymes to do their job. Amylase for carbohydrate digestion is inactivated in this acidic stomach environment, so carbohydrate digestion virtually stops in the stomach. The stomach is also designed with cells that produce mucus to protect the stomach lining from its own harsh acidic environment. We are indeed fearfully and wonderfully made. The stomach muscles go to work to churn and mix the food and liquid with these digestive enzymes to produce what I call a puree. This puree, known as chyme, is then ready to be propelled into the small intestines. Bicarbonates will enter the small intestines to alkalize the very acidic chyme coming in from the stomach. Enzymes from the liver and pancreas and bile from the gallbladder coming into the small intestines as well can now be activated in this alkaline environment to complete the breakdown of the carbohydrates as well as the proteins and fats as the chyme is moved along through the small intestines. Up to this point, we haven't mentioned much about the role of fiber in digestion. In the stomach, the undigested fiber slows the emptying of the chyme into the small intestines, giving us the feeling of fullness much longer. But here in the small intestines, fiber begins to play a more significant role. As the breakdown of the food continues, water and most of the nutrients from digestion are absorbed through the walls of the small intestines, leaving behind the metabolic waste produced during digestion. This waste includes undigested parts of food, including fiber, fluids, older cells from the lining of your digestive tract, as well as unwanted byproducts of digestion. 
Undigested fiber in the small intestines acts as a waste magnet, absorbing and carrying this waste into what I like to refer to as our large trash can or our colon. The colon's primary function is to then turn this liquid waste into a solid stool that can be eliminated. In other words, our poop. While undigested fiber plays a critical role in this process, it also serves as the primary food source for our good gut organisms. Through a process known as gut fermentation, these organisms break down undigested fiber in the colon, producing vital nutrients such as B vitamins needed in amounts greater than can be obtained from even the best diet. Short-chain fatty acids are also produced by this gut fermentation, such as butyrate, acetate, and propionate, which are important anti-inflammatory agents protecting the integrity of our colon cells. And these organisms even produce their own antibiotics. They don't want the bad guys taking up residence in our gut even more than we do. So these are key players in our immune response. We will look at gut fermentation in more detail in a later episode. But for now, just know that fiber, particularly from whole grains and real bread, are the most important food source for our good gut organisms. But for now, let's get back to our poopy talk. Through the contracting and relaxing of the colon, known as peristalsis, water is drawn into the colon. Fiber in the colon acts like a sponge. Consider our three functions of fiber. Fiber increases the bulk of the stool. If you need to visualize, let's think of a dry, shriveled, hard sponge at your kitchen sink that hasn't been used in a day or two. When we take that dry, hard sponge and put it in water, what is the first thing that happens? It absorbs the water and swells, gets bigger, right? Well, fiber does the same thing in our colon. Fiber absorbs the water drawn in by peristalsis and swells, increasing the bulk of the stool. Number one function of fiber. We will see why this is important in a moment. Moving to the second function of fiber. Fiber softens the stool. Think of our sponge again. When you put that dry, hard, shriveled up sponge down in water, While it swells and is now bigger in bulk, it is soft and pliable, no longer hard. This is a critical function of fiber to create a stool that, though large in bulk, is soft and can be easily and painlessly eliminated. Now, last but not least, our third function of fiber, the shortening of our transit time. The increased bulk of the stool puts pressure on the walls of our colon, stimulating peristalsis. Contract, relax, contract, relax. This is the feeling we get when we have the urge to eliminate. A consistent diet rich particularly in whole grains and real bread, including fresh fruits and vegetables, provides lots of fiber that will increase the bulk of our stools. This increased bulk puts pressure on the walls of our colon, giving us the urge to have a painless and complete poop at least once every day. And this should be our absolute minimum. Before I leave the sponge analogy, I want to make one more point about bran fiber. Bran fiber from wheat has a unique scrubbing effect that will keep our colon thoroughly clean and healthy each time we eliminate. Now it's time to look at what will happen to our digestion and elimination if we are not eating a diet rich in whole grains, real bread, and fresh fruits and vegetables. Instead of real whole foods, we are consuming the standard American diet of lots of meat, processed foods and bread, sodas, with maybe a few fresh fruits and vegetables. In other words, very little fiber as well as nutrients. We can go through this process fairly quickly since we have already laid a good foundation of digestion. We stated earlier the importance of chewing our food as digestion begins in the mouth, particularly carbohydrate digestion. Sadly, today, many of us eat in a rush, on the run, in the car, and we don't adequately chew our food. Foods that are not adequately chewed 
compromises our digestion and absorption of the nutrients all the way through our system. And some foods may even be eliminated without being broken down at all. Carbohydrate digestion is particularly compromised from inadequate chewing. As we gulp our food down, digestion continues into our stomach. Protein digestion is often compromised with the lack of acid production by the stomach or the heavy use of antacids that tend to alkalize the stomach environment. We will discuss this in more detail in a later episode and how this relates to food allergies and sensitivities. But once again, when digestion in one part of the process is not complete, it taxes the rest of the system. Foods that lack fiber will be thoroughly pureed in the stomach into chyme. Since there is little to no fiber in this meal to slow down this process, the chyme is emptied more quickly into our small intestines and we lose that feeling of fullness that we could have had. So the tendency to overeat and eat more frequently is very real. As the chyme is emptied into the small intestines, Our poor nutrition has often compromised our production of digestive enzymes as well as the alkalizing bicarbonates. With very little fiber present to slow digestion, the chyme passes quickly through our small intestines. This allows for a more rapid breakdown of carbohydrates, resulting in a more rapid rise in blood sugar levels, putting a greater demand on the body's insulin production. What little nutrients from this meal are absorbed through the walls of the small intestine. But this lack of nutrients in the foods we consume often leaves us craving more and even looking for more food to satisfy us even when we feel completely full. There's lots of metabolic waste from this meal as well as unidentifiable food particles. The waste will now be taken to our large trash can, just like before, to be eliminated but it is missing a key component, the fiber. The food for our good gut organisms is missing. So there is very little gut fermentation, if any. And we lose the abundant production of B vitamins so critical for maintaining our energy levels. We lose the production of the short-chain fatty acids and the anti-inflammatory protection they give. And we lose the immune protection from the production of the natural antibiotics by these organisms. As I mentioned earlier, we will discuss gut fermentation and the importance of these organisms in greater detail in a later episode. But for now, we need to poop or try to anyway. Remember we said that fiber is like a sponge that absorbs water? Well, in this scenario, the sponge is missing. No fiber in the chyme sent to our colon means there's no sponge to absorb the water that the colon draws in through its peristaltic motion. The colon will release the excess water, leaving the created stool dry and hard. No fiber means no increase of the bulk of the stool, no softening the stool, no pressure put on the walls of the colon to stimulate the urge to eliminate. So what do we do? We eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner each day devoid of sufficient fiber, so no urge to eliminate. This may go on for days, with the average American going five to seven days without a bowel movement. I am here today to tell you This is not normal, even though it is prevalent with most people. As this trash sits in our colon, waiting to be taken out day after day, the toxic substances there are often absorbed into our bodies. One of our body's responses to toxic buildup is to make mucus, so we can then eliminate these toxins by simply blowing our nose. I never realized that my chronic constipation was causing my chronic sinus congestion and my daily dependence on antihistamines, but real bread changed everything. With my chronic constipation relieved, I'm happy to say I have not had an antihistamine or a decongestant of any kind in more than 30 years since adding real bread to our diet. Now, as the pressure and discomfort continues to build in our bowels, we may decide that we need to at least try to eliminate. While trying to not get too graphic here, it is important for you to understand 
what is happening. As we push and strain, trying to eliminate a very hard stool, we might cause a tear in the anal lining known as a rectal fissure, causing pain and bleeding. Hemorrhoids are another common complaint with pain and bleeding caused by the strain of trying to eliminate a hard stool. Continued straining can lead to small pouches being formed in your colon known as diverticula, resulting in inflammation and infection as fecal material sits in the colon collecting in these pouches. Medical treatment for diverticulitis usually includes antibiotics, laxatives, and stool softeners. If the condition worsens or persists, surgical removal of the infected part of the colon may be necessary. But if the diet is not corrected, these diverticula might form in another part of the colon. As you can see, straining to eliminate can cause great pain and discomfort, but can be completely avoided when fiber-rich foods such as real bread are added to the diet. As fecal material continues to sit in our colon without elimination, the colon often responds with what I call hyperactivity. The colon will increase its peristaltic motion, drawing excess water in, but with no fiber or sponge to absorb this water, the result is chronic diarrhea and the chronic urge to eliminate often uncontrollably each day. This issue, also known as irritable bowel syndrome, affects nearly 40 million Americans today and as many as 800 million people worldwide. By now, you may be thinking of the phrase I hear so often after my poopy talk. You just described me. But the truth is, I just described most Americans and much of the industrialized world. But hopefully your lights went on and you made the critical connection between the health issues you may be dealing with and the absence of daily bowel movements. The medical recommendation for each of these common health issues is to add more fiber to your diet. But the simple truth as stated earlier in this episode, most people do not get enough fiber in their diets and don't know how to realistically increase their intake. Unfortunately, the bread you may be buying in the store, despite even its whole grain or multigrain label, will not provide the fiber you need. The bran and germ is often partially stripped from these products and a significant amount of gluten fiber, the protein portion of white flour, is added to make softer, more palatable bread. This commercially processed bread will actually constipate you. The addition of fresh fruits and vegetables to our diets will certainly help, but they mostly provide soluble fiber that will help in softening the stool. But it is the insoluble fiber found in whole grains that can truly improve your bowel habits. We have heard so many almost miraculous testimonies of the complete reversal and resolution of these often debilitating and painful complaints when bread, real bread from freshly milled whole grains becomes a part of the diet. I find it interesting that fiber from whole grains and real bread can correct what appears to be opposite complaints, chronic constipation and chronic diarrhea. If you are looking for an easy and delicious way to add more fiber to your diet, why not start with real bread, but only real bread made from freshly milled whole grain flour that you can make for yourself at home that has not had any of the bran and germs sifted away and provides both soluble and insoluble fiber. Our bodies were designed to take out the trash every day Let's give it what it needs to do its job. It's the bread. I'm telling you, it's the bread, but only real bread. I want to thank you for joining me today. I hope you will visit our store or our website, breadbeckers.com, or better yet, join us for a class. Let us help you get started on your journey to better health through real food. Until next time, this is Sue Becker. 
from Bread Beckers with Sue's Healthy Minutes. Sue's Healthy Minutes podcast has been a presentation by the Bread Beckers Incorporated located in Woodstock, Georgia. For more information, store hours, and learning opportunities, visit breadbeckers.com and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast and never miss an episode. Share this with two friends who would benefit from this information and be sure to join us again next week for more of Sue's Healthy Minutes.